start talking about all this stuff, I'd like to take a poll of you all. How many of you here are banjo players? Yay! Okay, I figured most of you would be. How many of you here have never heard of Bill Keith? Okay, everybody's heard of him. How many of you play Keith-style banjo? Or, no, how many of you don't play Keith-style banjo? Okay, so... And you, if you, not, why not? Well, uh, well we, um, we'll maybe address some of the common <laughs> misconceptions. And um, how many of you have met Bill Keith? Okay, you know, th some of you who have been coming to this festival for a while will remember that there's always a teepee over in the sponsor camping area, and Bill would hang out there, and he's a guy who hangs out and loves to, loves to play music, or he, he did. He passed away in October of last year at age 75, and if you just ran into him at the festival and he was this guy you would talk to and he'd always be eager to talk about music and banjo, you might not realize that he is, in my opinion, the second most important banjo player in bluegrass. There are many great players, but I think Bill, would you agree with me? He might be the in second ways, most important. In some yeah, ways, I think he's the most important because uh, somebody always has to start right. something, and Earl, Earl certainly did that. But Bill not only mastered Earl's timing and tone uh, and his repertoire, but he bridged the gap between that and the modern player. Yeah, and I think without what he did, the new grass of the, of the 70s and onward would be un unimaginable. Because let's face it, 
the banjo is the signature instrument of bluegrass. Can I hear an amen? Amen. To okay. That. And Bill, you know, Earl Scruggs established what the banjo could do in bluegrass and set a path that everybody else more or less followed, even if they had their own take on it. But Bill gave it an entirely new voice. Tony Rice was, in, was uh, interviewed in Bluegrass Unlimited recently. I don't know if you all saw that, but he, uh, he made a great statement, I thought, that uh, basically dog music wouldn't have even happened if it weren't for Bill and the formation, of, well, his first recording, uh, which, asked, which he asked Grisman to be on and then later led to the Mule Skinner sessions. So um, before, before we let these great players show some of what Bill, Bill's music was like, I want to just kind of briefly describe how it works. You know, the Scrug style banjo, it's this magical sound, these shimmering clouds of notes. But if you want to play a really fast scale, you can't do it in Scrug style. The fiddles, the mandolins, guitars, they can do it with their flat picks and bows. And you could try, you know, the, the normal way you'd play a scale on a string instrument is you start with a note, you play the next note, it's going to be on the same string, and at some point it becomes convenient to go to the next string, and you do a couple of notes on the next string, a couple of notes on the next string. And if you try to do that, you could... <laughs> no, no, you stupid rabbit, it goes like this. <laughs> some, some there is no bad note, that. though, by the way. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's for the Bugs Bunny fans out there. But any, any, who invited this guy? <laughs> anyway, um, and you can do that with your thumb and your index like Eddie Adcock and Don Reno Pioneer, but it, it sounds very choppy and it can be done smoothly, but it's all very difficult to do. And Bill came up with this whole other approach. Because on a string instrument you can get any note in several places on the neck, Bill said, okay, we'll take that note, that's a G, and let's not play that on the same string. Let's play it on, on a different string. We'll play it on the next lower string, and that means you have to go higher up. So we're playing two notes in the scale on a different string, and then the next note of the scale we can play open, and then, no, we don't want to do that on the same string, so we do it lower, higher up on a lower string. Open string, sorry. Open string. No, we don't want to do that there. Higher up on a lower string. So you're, you're jumping... You're getting higher notes on lower strings and then going up. It's, it's screwy. It's like a The whole idea is you want to be rolling from finger to finger. So you have to find the note you need next in a place on another string where you can just play it in sequence. Yeah, so the idea is you don't do any two notes in a row on the same string. No two eighth notes in a row yeah. on the same so string. So rather than doing... Yeah, see, if you can do it like Ron, you, you, know, you, can, you can get it to sound smooth. And then you get up to there and you think, well, can I go higher? Well, no, I can't there, but if I, instead of that note, I get it up there. And then you can start finding patterns. Yeah, well, that's the, the John Hartford but thing. how did Bill find these notes on the banjo? How did he get Well, I, I don't know, did he just sort of, like sort of think about it? Yeah, I mean, Well, he was that kind of guy, wasn't he? Yeah. But, well. You, you were, weren't you telling me, or was it somebody else about about um, Devil's Dream, the first song we played? It's a it's a it's an old t tune from the British Isles. You don't hear you didn't hear it down south much, but you'd hear it a lot in the Canadian Maritimes and in New England. And Bill knew a fiddle player who played that tune. And uh, you, well, you tell the story. Did you sound like you got it more accurate than well, I did? Well, uh, this was um, in between summers, I believe, when he was at Amherst College. By the way, everybody. Martin Keith on banjo. I mean, I get on bass back here, thinking banjo, but playing bass, yeah. Martin Keith, so Bill's son is right here with us today, and I, I, I have goosebumps. Yeah. Where are for your jeans? <laughs> so, so I'm looking at Martin for guidance here, but I believe around when Bill attended Amherst College between 57 and 61, he came home during the summers to the Boston suburbs and one of his neighbors uh, named June, the wife of a machinist. Well, so yeah, yeah. Loring Hall. Loring Hall. Um, do, can, we, can we get this up to you there? If you, if you pass the full Loring story. Hall was a machinist Sweet friend it. of his. Uh, based on uh, first a mutual interest in old cars, I believe, <laughs> he met Loring, who to this day uh, is, is still living into his ripe old age. Um, and they worked on cars together, and that machine shop next to Loring's house is where he also developed the first prototypes of the Keith tuners. Yeah. More on that later. Yeah, more but on that later. Yeah. Loring's wife, June, is a fiddle player from, I think, Cape Breton. 
Um, yeah. So she knew all these tunes, and so Devil's Dream and Sailor's Horn Effect and tunes like that, he first learned from June. There's an interesting thing about that, actually. Um, so he learned those tunes from June, and there's kind of a, a chain where um, uh, Tony Trishka learned a lot of those tunes from Bill, and Bela learned a lot of those tunes from mm -hmm. Tony, yeah. and so on and so on down the line. Of, and Bela hired um, a sax player right. for the Flectones named, gosh, what's his name? Jeff uh, Coffin. Jeff Coffin, yeah. who is June Hall's, I think, great nephew or something like that. Yeah, that was like an amazing, <laughs> yeah. it's like a very small town. Small world situation. Um, yeah. Well, Bill, Bill said that he had heard June play this Devil's Dream and that he went to bed that night and he woke up the next morning and he said, I know how to put that on the banjo. <laughs> that's great. That, yeah. That's exactly what he told me. And, and you know, the, the roots of, of you know, this higher note on a lower string style were, were there were little smatterings of it here and there among the great old like Don Reno players. and Don like Stover. Don Reno played banjo signal, one, the B oh, part. Yeah. yeah. So that got that, that C over here, or that, that five note, the four note over here. So there's that two note yeah. roll anyway. And I think Bill might have heard that because Bill was listening to Reno and it was even playing. I actually have recordings of Bill playing single string. Yeah. Hmm. And, and Don Stover did. And then there's a whole whole tune, Noah's Breakdown by Noah Crace, which mm -hmm. it sounds like fully developed melodic style. But here's the thing, it, you know, people will come up with stuff like that and it's a really cool tune. But Bill took the extra step to saying, no, this is not just Devil's okay. Dream. Yeah. This is something we can apply to anything that has scales in it. Once you have that scale. It's just positions and rolls. And those are all, those yeah. are all little patterns that show up in fiddle tunes and you can use them in fiddle tunes or you can use them in other things. And, other thing is, Tony, Tony Trishka made a really good point years ago in an article. He said, people talk about Scruggs style and melodic style, but that's it's really kind of wrong. Scruggs style really is a style. It's got specific things that when you hear it, it sounds like Scruggs, you know. You know, that stuff. He said, melodic style is not a style. It's a technique that can be applied to many, many yeah. different styles, to bluegrass, yeah, to Bobby, jazz, Bobby to classical. Bobby Thompson's melodic style is different from Bill Keith's melodic style yeah. is different from Alan Mundy's Well, uh, well yeah, and that's just within bluegrass, but you yeah. can go and you can apply yeah, it to, you know, you can, uh, yeah, right, yeah. Who, who does, like, honest to God bebop yeah. in melodic technique, or you can do, you know, which is bop, and, you know, I couldn't not have done that without. Not to mention Bela Fleck. Well, Bela yeah. Fleck. I told you not to mention yeah. Bela Fleck. Yeah. Um, so it, it, on the one hand, it like I say, it gave the band show a whole new voice, opened up vistas of possibility that nobody had glimpsed before. And also, here's another thing. This was happening at a time when there were more, how many Yankees we got here? Come on, homeboy. <laughs> um, this was happening at a time when more and more northerners were getting into bluegrass, when more and more urban college students, Jewgrass. urban college students were getting into bluegrass music. And here was this guy from New England who was this innovative musician who got a job playing with Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys. And Bill Monroe would always mention that he was a Yankee from Massachusetts. And he would say, I always hoped that a Southern boy could learn to play those fiddle tunes right, but Brad Keith was the man who did it. And he called him Brad so there wouldn't be two Bills in the band. Bill's middle name was Bradford. Well, what was amazing about Bill is he really foundationally started with Scrugg style, and during the Amherst College years, he transcribed all of, most mm -hmm. of, of Earl Scruggs' recordings, and then it was in 1962, after winning the, the learning the Devil's Dream the way he played it, and playing it at the Philadelphia Folk Festival and winning the banjo contest, he went down to uh, work with Frank Wakefield, and then in D.C. area, and got tickets backstage to see and meet Earl Scruggs, and brought his book of, of tablatures that he worked on at Amherst College backstage and showed Earl Scruggs, who couldn't read tablature or music notation, because Bill could read, he wrote it out in music notation as well as tablature. And um, Earl looked at it and asked Bill to play from the book for him. And he was impressed that 
it looked as though Bill was playing the exact notes from, from the tunes. And so then invited Bill uh, down to stay with him for several weeks on and off um, in Nashville, where he brought him to the Grand Old Opry and backstage hanging out, playing The Devil's Dream. Kenny Baker heard it, grabbed Monroe, and Monroe had the wonderful foresight to realize that this was something else. Perspicacity. Yeah. So, and that was how he got into the, the Bluegrass Boys. And this, was, this yeah. was a big deal for these, these Northern Bluegrass fans, that here was one of their own, you know, a Yankee college boy playing with Bill Monroe and doing this innovation that was just blowing people's minds. And also, how, how many, what percentage of Bluegrass banjo players do you think learned out of the Scruggs book or have the Scruggs book on their shelf? Probably uh, 70 yeah. or 80 percent. Yeah, 70 or 80%, and that's, that's Bill <coughs> Keith doing. It's Bill all Keith's work. And Bill didn't see a dollar out of it. Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. that's another story, but we won't get yeah. into that. But, so he not only created this whole new way to play banjo that, had, that has ripple effects for the last 50 years, but he also spread the ability to learn Scruggs style all over the world in, way, in a way that nobody really had before. Yeah. And I mean, I think both of those two things um, I think are really behind why, uh, why last fall he was inducted into the International Bluegrass Hall of Fame. Um, and I'm really so glad that he was alive to see it when that happened. Yeah, much has been made of and said about Bill's melodic style. Uh, I've always placed a, a great deal of emphasis on the other nuances of his playing. And speaking of his, his short tenure with Monroe, one of the singles that Monroe immediately dragged him into the studio to record was uh, Shenandoah Breakdown. Uh -huh. uh, and Bill's playing on that, uh, except for a short little passage at the end of the, the B, at the middle of the B part, uh, in the middle of the A part as well, it's not really a melodic tune. But his right hand, his rolls, his syncopations, his little subtleties, uh, <clears throat> of music, the things that showed off his musical erudition uh, are what got to me more than the melodic stuff. Like, can you have so, an example? So let's play that. <laughs> Most of these were written for the tuned banjo, so if you want to. <laughs> the way he played that kind of scrug style but then he put in these beautiful lines like can you demonstrate one of those lines mark that like sure. makes it bill it's just this flowing rolling thing played it up to speed now Yeah. 
next. You are. You can feel what you've done. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, so, everybody, this is Mark Horowitz. He's not listed, but uh, this past week, I, I don't know, I was thinking about Mark and wondering why is he not involved in this. So I, I gave him a call, and so thankfully, the Gray Fox community opened up their arms, as you would expect, to have Mark Horowitz, who's one of my great mentors, be here. So like most of the Jew grass boys, I was born in, in Brooklyn, in New York City, and uh, I came up during the, the halcyon days of the Washington Square Park, Greenwich Village, University of Bluegrass, which would be every Sunday during spring and summer, we would gather around the fountain in the middle of the square and form these little nucleotides of, of uh, bluegrass bands, play for an hour or two and get all dehydrated in the hot sun and then fission and then reform with different bands. So in one band, one day it might be me on banjo, Eric Weisberg on fiddle or mandolin, Steve Mandel on guitar, uh, uh, Wendy Winston would be there, David Grisman. So all these cats would just hang around for six hours out in the sun and play music all day. And that's where I really, you know, learned to, I learned endurance for one thing. I don't have any anymore, but, but just being able to stand and play uh, with very little in the way of refreshment, uh, except for a dirty water hot dog sometime around 3 o'clock. Uh, but this is where our, uh, a lot of us, Marty Cutler, we, we, where we cut our teeth on this music. Uh, there was a, a healthy spirit of competition amongst the banjo players, which was a real, a real spur to our mutual development. I know Marty and I used to run down, when we heard of a new release of a Monroe single, we would take the train in, him from Rockaway in Queens and me from Brooklyn, to go to the uh, Liberty Music on, um, on Broadway and 52nd Street and score these DECA singles and haul ass home and see who could get home first and figure it out first. And me living in Brooklyn, since I, I was closer, I got home first, and by the time Marty got back to Rockaway, I had already worked out Salt Creek or Shenandoah Creek. <laughs> so, uh, but that was that was a really fun time, and I've had the privilege, privilege had the privilege of knowing Bill since about 1964. We were talking before about Monroe. Uh, Bill, uh, when did you first meet Bill? Or I met Bill. Oh, I met Bill at the Queens College Folk mm -hmm. Festival, which is a little local college folk festival in New York around 1964. Uh, he played with Rooney, and he invited me to come up to Cambridge that weekend. So I just jumped in his car on, at 11 o'clock at night after that show and went up to Cambridge. Didn't tell my mother and father or nothing. I just jumped in the car. And that was a mistake. <laughs> Bill had a, a 60 Chevy Bel Air with a 327 Corvette engine in it, and lowered suspension and Michelin racing tires, and we made it from Queens to Cambridge in three hours. What? <laughs> yeah. I've driven from Queens to Cambridge, and nothing just, like that. Let's just say it was very cloudy in that car. <laughs> so it's, it seemed like three hours, but... <laughs> probably put that shot together. Probably put that car together. Yeah. yeah. Uh, at any rate, a few, trips, a few trips up to Cambridge later, Bill had told me to bring my banjo up uh, with me to the Club 47. We were going to go see Monroe. This is probably around 1965, and uh, Bill came over to me... Uh, during the first set, and he said, three songs into the second set, you're gonna go up and play a couple of tunes with Bill, with Bill Monroe. And I said, really? And he says, well, that's why I wanted you to bring your banjo. So I was just, I was just frozen. But I screwed up my courage. I got up there, I played Shenandoah Breakdown and uh, Molly and Ten Brooks. And I got ready to leave the stage after I finished up, and Monroe grabs my arm, pulls it back, and he leans into the microphone, he says, Tell me, son, did you learn on Brad? Brad was Bill Keith's middle name, Bradley. Bradford. And, and, Gifted uh, name. There couldn't be two Bills in that band, so Monroe insisted on him being called Brad. So he, he, heard my, he heard Bill's influence on my playing quite readily. So that's my Monroe story. Anyway, uh, Bill graciously let me record some stuff when he played Gertie's Folk City in 1965 with uh, Rooney. Jim Rooney, his playing partner of many years, 
and David Grisman sat in for the whole week as well. So I hauled a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder in on the subway uh, and recorded a bunch of stuff in the basement. And one of these things was Bill's uh, version of Black Mountain Rag, which he learned from somebody up in New England. I don't know. I don't remember the name of the banjo player. Was it, it wasn't Stover? No, it wasn't Stover. He did a lot of detail. Yeah. Uh, so we do a medley of that and um, uh, Ruben's train.